So um, as you know, many instructional designers use your principles as a foundation for designing learning experiences. Uh, however, the depth of understanding and the knowledge of your principles would vary greatly you know, from person to person. And as a result, many learning and development professionals see that the redundancy principle and the modality principle as being non-inclusive and not conducive to universal design practices. So um, my question is, how do you see accessibility fitting within the principles of your book? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question, Georgette. It's something um, I've thought about, but it's obviously not been our major focus. So we really need a lot of help in this area of accessibility and how to um, you know, adjust and adapt the principles that we've established for, you know, diverse sets of learners. Um, so I think that's a really, I think that's a really important goal for us. And, you know, as um, uh, Cecile, Cecile said, um, there are boundary conditions to all of these principles. Um, they're not, I, I never intended them to be like, this is the way you have to do things. We ha always have to understand who are the learners? What's the content? What's the situation? What are our goals? And mainly we have to understand how do people process information and how can we present um, material in a way that um, that is you know, consistent with the way our cognitive architecture is set up. So, um, I completely agree with the thrust of your question and specifically about redundancy. I mean, I think that is certainly a principle that has lots of boundary conditions depending on the characteristics of the learners. And, and of course, you want, you want to have both printed text and spoken text for, I mean, there are lots of groups of learners. We've been looking at learning in a second language, for example. Um, uh, and in many cases, having subtitles is 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 helpful. And a lot of a lot of college instruction around the world's in English, but the learners uh, for the learners, English isn't their first language. So we need a lot more research on how to how to design those situations. But certainly there, I don't think the redundancy principle applies, and it obviously doesn't apply for people who have. <laughs> um, challenges with sight or hearing. So um, I completely agree with the thrust of your question. The same goes for modality. If, um, if you have uh, hearing disorders, then yeah, we need, we need to present words in printed text rather than spoken. But I think it goes a lot deeper than that. There are huge individual differences in the way people process information. And I think we're just beginning to understand how to adapt these principles for a wider group of learners. I hope that answers your question. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Sure. And I was going to ask, and it, you sort of talked about this because I am doing a little bit of research for one of my classes right now about having printed text with narration specifically. And most of the research that I've found is for uh, second language learners. Uh -huh. But have we done any of that or have you done any of that research or know of any research about having printed text with narration, but no other graphical elements and whether or not that helps people learn? Yeah, it, I think it doesn't hurt. I mean, um, it's not a violation of the redundancy principle because you have the print coming in through your visual system. You have the words coming in through your auditory channel. So you, you have not, you've not, you haven't overloaded the visual channel. That's the problem when you have printed text, graphics, and narration at the same time. Then you can have split attention between the printed text and the graphics, or um, could be, uh, you know, a video or an animation. Um, but in this case, where there's no graphics, you're not overloading the cognitive system. So I, I think we've eliminated that problem. And when you're learning, like you're saying in a second language, it can be helpful to at least to see part of the 
narration in print because some some words are kind of hard to hear, especially if they're technical words. I mean, this is even learning in your first language for technical words and um, just comp complicated um, um, terms. It's good. it's probably helpful to see them. So I think we need a lot more research on what's the right balance. Do we need to have everything in print or could we just have the hard part in print, something like that? Because I think one problem, uh, one problem with you know listening to narration is it's a lot slower than than reading. You can read a lot faster than you can listen. So in that sense, it's inefficient. But there are situations where you're just you want to listen. <laughs> so, um, but just to answer your question, um, yeah, the research we've done shows it doesn't hurt to have them both at the same time. Whether it's helpful, I think, you know, kind of, it kind of depends on, the, like I said, the complexity of the material, whether there's a lot of technical terms, whether the words are unfamiliar for the learners. Does that make sense? Indeed, it does. <laughs> um, and just as an aside, I think that a lot of the sort of audiobook providers have the ability to let you speed up your narration so that it can match your reading speed. And I think that that can be very impactful as well. That's, that's very true. Um, although it starts to sound like a chipmunk. So there's got to be a way to deal with that too. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, um, John Sweller and his folks talk about the transitory nature of spoken text. So that's another issue. When it's printed, you have a little more learner control for where you put your eyes and, and you can go back and reread. But when it's spoken, once it's gone, it's it's gone and it, it's not gonna last that long in your working memory. So that's another issue to keep keep in mind. Thank you for answering that because we actually had a big debate in our live chat, which will probably be very boring for you, but it's me, Shaka, Courtney, like all arguing over this. But I'm gonna I'm gonna clarify the question a little bit to see if it's the same answer. So okay. um Shaka was kind of talking about second uh our language learners, right? Non-native speakers. So if we have regular speakers and we say that they're pretty familiar with the words, because I know your boundary condition is, you know, whether or not the lexicon's like very technical um, or very new to them. So let's say it's regular, regular, <laughs> it's a terrible term. Uh, well, you're learning in your first language. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's native learner. Yeah, learners who are native speakers of the language and they're not learning uh, new technical terms. Um, does it, if it does not violate the redundancy and modality principle, does it impede modality offloading if you are looking at graphics and listening to the exact same graphics at the same time? Because I know it's different when you just see like select terms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're listening to narration. So in this case, if you are getting both exactly at the same time, does that mean you're not doing modality offloading or impeding it? So describe the situation. Again, so you have graphics and narration? Um, printed text and narration that are exactly the same. So kind of the same thing Shaka described. Mm -hmm. um, you said it doesn't hurt or violate the modality and redundancy principle. And I guess my question is, but does it impede how you describe modality offloading? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess. Um... The reason we want modality offloading is if we need the visual channel, you know, to process visual material that we might have around. So if there's no graphics, then we don't have to offload, I guess is is the idea. Does that make sense? Yes, Shaka was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if anybody's right. I, th this way I see it. I think we're all kind of searching for how to how to make this all work and what are good design principles that are consistent with what we know about human information processing. So it's um, it's kind of a logic problem and an empirical problem. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, 
And I, you kind of mentioned Sweller uh, just, just in a moment. So I know that in the third edition of Multimedia Learner, you cite Sweller for a boundary condition when modality offloading doesn't work so well for learners with low working memory capacity. Now, I don't know if Sweller was explicitly testing that group of learners or if that those groups of learners were just in his general student population. Um, but the question is, has your research included, whether explicitly or not, neurodivergent learners uh, and learners with disabilities, such as those who cannot see or hear? Well, I'm sure we've included um, neurodivergent learners um, without explicitly you know, targeting them because they're a big part of our population. We know if we just look at, I know, like the statistics at UCSB, we there's a uh, you know, a substantial um, percentage of neurodivergent learners, but we haven't specifically targeted them in our research, and we haven't tried to specifically look at how the principles might apply, but that's an area that I think we really need a lot more um, research in. I'm, I'm really particularly interested in learners who have um, what's the best way to put this, attention control challenges, because I think um, these are the learners that probably would benefit the most from you know, good, good instructional design. It, if you have good executive function skills, you might be able to survive poorly designed instruction. But if your executive function skills, um, your, like your ability to multitask or to... Um, you know, um, inhibit processing of irrelevant material or just control your attention so you focus on the relevant material. If, if those are challenges for you, then I think that's where good instructional design can be particularly helpful. So I'm kind of excited about the idea of trying to work with that population. Um, but we haven't, we've talked about it a lot in my lab, but we haven't really done it in a systematic way. I mean, I mean, we could just define it as, you know, working memory. Sometimes people define it as, you know, working memory um, uh, challenges, having a um, scoring lower on a working memory capacity test or uh, working memory processing. But I think we need to be more specific about what's going on there. So that's where I, that's why I like to look more at the issue of executive function, which is certainly related to working memory um, and really the issue of attentional control. So yeah, I, I, just a, it's a long answer to your question, but um, so I haven't explicitly been working with neurodivergent learners or learners with disabilities, but I do think that's something I'd like to do. And I do think that's something we need a lot more research on. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we know some people that might want to help you work on that. So if you ever like need some contacts, the person that we had that was working at Space Center Houston, one of my friends, Rachel Schwartzman, is one of the, well, she's one of the growing minds in that field. So just let us know if you want to work with her. Sure. Um, just have her shoot me an email. I'd love to find out more about it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's just uh, an area where we could do a lot of good. So um, I would like to, to think more about it. I think it's uh, difficult to find the balance between, and this came up in our live book chat, where um, if we automatically turn captions on, Rachel was saying uh, the benefit of that is that people don't have to disclose their disabilities. Um, the drawback of that would be violating the principles for people who don't need it. Um, so there's really... A good question. And I, I know people are always looking for a universal yes or no, and there is none because <laughs> it depends on the conditions. But I guess what would you, your recommendation be in that case um, for trying to balance, uh, you know, avoiding people to have to self disclose versus, you know, doing what is most beneficial, I guess, in instructionally? So you have to design things that are accessible. And I think the the way it's often done is the way you're doing it. You just put everything there and then you have to opt out. Um, 
but like you say that <laughs> that a lot of people don't opt out a lot of people don't do <laughs> they just go with whatever's being presented to them and if it would be better for that let's say for the captions not to be there for some learners then it would be better to have an opt-in system so i think that's a really hard 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 issue about um how to set it up i mean in my dream world i would have like a preliminary um lesson where you get to see different versions of it and choose the version that you're most comfortable with i think that would probably be the the best way to do it like i just had a set up a, a a tv and you have all these choices for yeah do you want captions do you want all these things so at least at the beginning it gives you kind of a yes or no choice it doesn't it doesn't just do it one way and then you have to opt in or out but it gives you choices without really telling you what the implications are of those choices <laughs> so i think it would be good to have like a little trial run and then you have kind of a yes no choice on what you want to do i'd but like I that just yeah. like I feel like we live in a world where your settings should be remembered and even the software that you use can realize when you're learning better or worse or what components about your learning are, are affected by whether or not captions are on or something like that. I feel like that world is it should be close to me. Right. It, it should. Yeah. Um, like if you're I'm thinking of my wife, she likes closed captions sometimes. It helps her. I don't know, understand the dialogue. So yeah, sometimes she doesn't turn it on or sometimes she leaves it on when it doesn't have to be on. So it'd be nice if it just said, do you do you, you usually have closed caption on for this? Do you do you want it on now? <laughs> I mean, that that wouldn't be too annoying, I don't think. <laughs> so yeah, I, I agree with you. It would be I don't think we're that far from a world where um you know, the, the system we're interacting with will remember our preferences. And that's really interesting because we still have to worry about things like font size for the WCAG standards, but I mean, so much of this is changeable through your browser. So I'm wondering if we're going to reach a point where, you know, they take more of that into consideration because basically they usually, I feel like they don't want you to rely on um, things that you can change in your browser. Mm -hmm.